How blind is justice in Brazil? The uh, justice minister, Sergio Moro, in the hot seat in the wake of leaked messages and audio tapes that show the then crusading anti-corruption magistrate conspiring with prosecutors to hasten their case against the country's most popular politician, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, Lula, who was prevented from running for president again last year and instead sits in jail, convicted over kickbacks and money laundering as part of the Operation Car Wash scandal. The country's highest court to review that conviction, which now raises doubts over the election of far-right leader Jair Bolsonaro, and brings us to the broader question. Was what started as a routine money laundering probe in 2014 and has since snowballed into more than 400 prosecutions, Operation Car Wash bringing down the powerful from across the political spectrum, has it ultimately strengthened or weakens Brazil's democracy. Meeting last week with judges from the Americas, Pope Francis denounced what he termed lawfare, judicial crackdowns he feels have weakened democracies. How to support the fight against corruption while ensuring that it's not weaponized for political gain. Today in the France 24 debate, we're looking at Brazil's judiciary under scrutiny. Joining us from Rio, Andrew Fishman, who is managing editor of The Intercept, the uh, news media that has brought us uh, those leaks and did that investigative reporting. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. From Lisbon, we say hello to Brazilian attorney Fernando Santiago. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. And here in the studio, we're joined by France 24's Tatiana Reiter. How are you? Good. Happy to be here. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24debate. As Brazil's top court convenes, interested parties uh, from those intercept leaks have uh, been reacting. Uh, Haxi Mars Belkin has more. Specially appointed justice minister who sent a former president to prison. Now Sergio Moro is on the defense after a website published what it says are leaked messages from a corruption probe during his time as a judge. I can't even say if these messages are authentic. These are things that happened years ago. Judges speak to prosecutors, judges speak to the lawyers, judges speak to police. That is normal. In the leaked messages, exchanges between Moro and prosecutors, in which he appears to give them advice on the focus and pace of their investigations. The lead prosecutor concerned also denies allegations of collusion, although he has offered an apology of sorts. Even though we don't believe these scattered messages are trustworthy, we do recognize that they're making some people uncomfortable, and we're deeply sorry about that. Moro was the highest-ranking judge in the five-year-long anti-corruption car wash probe, which jailed scores of politicians and business figures. The chief justice was personally responsible for handing a custodial sentence to ex-president Luis Inácio Lula da Silva, a decision that blocked him from seeking re-election last year. Lula's lawyers are now saying his sentence should be overturned. Reaction on the streets is mixed. From what was shown, this calls his impartiality into question. It was a private conversation in a private sphere. So I don't see any misconduct. I can't see anything that would tarnish Sergio Moro's image. Not yet, perhaps. But the site that published the messages is promising that the exchanges between Moro and prosecutors revealed so far are only the tip of the iceberg. Sergio Moro, who has met with President Jair Bolsonaro, ahead of a session of the country's highest court, which is to decide whether or not to review the case against uh, Lula. Uh, Andrew Fishman, f first question, wh what's your reaction to that apology we heard in that report from the state prosecutor? Well, what's the most important thing to remember is that they never denied the, the veracity of our reporting which is really important. Um, so they're saying that what we have is real, and 
Uh, by the fact that they're they're apologizing, they're already showing that they that they're on the defensive. They're trying to minimize uh, the the importance of of what we've published. However, if you talk to Brazilian jurists, to specialists, it's clear that it's that they're they're underplaying the the severity of what's going on. There's this is very severe ethical violations. They're very severe misconduct. That um, if you, I mean, I believe that any Brazilian who is accused of a crime would not want to be tried in a, in a case where the prosecutor and the judge are secretly uh, collaborating to, to uh, advance the investigation against the defense without the defense's uh, knowledge. Uh, a, a key in, the, uh, in one of those three articles that you've published so far, and you say there's many more to come, um, is this um, three-story uh, apartment, a triplex, uh, that uh, was uh, that was at the heart of Lula's uh, conviction. Explain to us why that's so important. Yes. So uh, Lula was convicted on a corruption charge that said the essence is he received this triplex beachfront apartment that's worth approximately one point two million dollars, and he received it as a bribe from the OAS construction company. Uh, in exchange for Lula facilitating uh, multi-million dollar contracts with Petrobras, which is the, the state-controlled oil company. Now, what we saw in the leaked conversations that we published on is that four days before, three days before, the night before, Deltan Dalagnol, the chief prosecutor, talking to with his staff, had serious doubts about the quality of their evidence. They had, he had serious doubts as to whether they could actually affirm that the triplex belonged to Lula because there's no, in the trial, there was no actual material evidence. Uh, the, it was based on, on uh, testimony from, from other people who were implicated in a bribery scheme who were trying to get reduced sentencing. And uh, the other thing that they weren't sure that they could prove was the link to the corruption scheme. And that's really, really important because if they couldn't prove that the triplex was a bribe as linked to uh, Petrobras contracts, then the case would have fallen out of their jurisdiction and it would have gone to the, the Sao Paulo, their, their, their colleagues in Sao Paulo. So they weren't sure that the case would fall, could fall in their jurisdiction. They, were, they had to uh, defend that in the Supreme Court and they, they claimed without providing the evidence that we have the evidence but we can't show it. Um, and they won, which appears to be that they were bluffing. They didn't actually have the goods, uh, but they, they really wanted to keep the case in their, in their jurisdiction. And then, you know, at the very, at the very uh, eve of, of the prosecution, they weren't even sure if the triplex was theirs. They find a, an article from the old Global newspaper from six years previous that says, the triplex belongs to Lula. And the quote from Delton to his colleagues is, I, will kiss whoever, I want to kiss whoever found this article. This is amazing. And then they use this as a key piece of evidence in, the, in their accusation, and it's cited in Judge Moro's decision to convict him. However, as we point out in the article, uh, the, the global article from 2010 was written before the building that the triplex was in actually existed. There's two buildings. Global has his triplex as the one being behind, in the building behind, not the building in front that he was actually convicted on and that they confiscated. So that's a huge, uh, um, it's a huge uh, lapse in the, in the evidence that they haven't been able to explain and that they either didn't pick up on or ignored at the time, but it shows the weakness of their case at the time. Yeah, at one point uh, you write the prosecutor, uh, Deltan Dalagnol, uh, writes uh, that uh, uh, about the, that triplex, the indictment's based on a lot of indirect evidence of authorship but it wouldn't fit to say that in the indictment and in our communications we avoided uh, that uh, point. Uh, your reactions uh, to, to these revelations, Fernando Santiago? Well, uh, thank you, Pierre, for uh, this time to solve this debate. I think my reaction, of course, uh, it's uh, mitigated because uh, we are talking about evidence that we uh, don't know uh, the authenticity of it. Uh, it's well. Let me put it straight. There's politically, of course, there's a huge turmoil. Uh, Bolsonaro's uh, government is anchored by two great names, 
and one of them is Sérgio Moro, and any polemical uh, concerning uh, Sérgio Moro is not good for them. Of course, it has many enemies. Bolsonaro is not a consensual seeker, uh, far away from that. People don't like him. I, I don't blame them for his style is very uh, confusing and hard. People even try to murder him before the election. That's for the political. But now, uh, concerning the technical side of it, I think it's a kind of a interesting to take a look on that. First of all, uh, on the legal point of view, we should analyze it in three different uh, aspects. First of all, is content. Uh, well, of course, uh, I, what is linked on the, on the press shows what could be said as a promiscuous relationship between uh, the judge and some of the prosecutors. The, the contact with the judge and the prosecutors itself is not illegal. He can have contact with everybody, of course, but what's forbidden is that a judge could give tips to a prosecutor's operation, or, which is he's supposed to be completely exempt from that, and the prosecutor should convince the judge that his, he has a good case, of course, and the judge may say to hear the defense side and say, okay, go, don't go, etc. Uh, so for, from that point of view, of course, uh, uh, it seems uh, we, we have a problem on that point of view, but uh, we have to take the conversation into a context. We all know uh, how damaged conversations out of the context can be taken. I'm not saying but that's do you the think? Case. I just but do you think the that the um, do you think that the court was duped in convicting Lula? Uh, I, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, the thing is, uh, one other thing that we should we should analyze. We cannot conf uh, make a confusion between uh, material law and uh, a procedural law. What is in case here is procedural law. I mean, the proofs were hard enough because Sergio Moro was just the first judge who judged Lula. He was judged by five judges on second instance later on, and then by 11 judges on the Superior Court. So the evidences are really hard. If not, he couldn't convince all the, these judges by unan unanimous convince, uh, convicted Lula. So we're talking about a, a, pro a problem of procedure, not a problem on material law. That's one point that needs to be clarified. The same uh, evidence can be brought back to the beginning, and Lula could be judged again uh, from the same facts based on the same evidences. Tatiana Ryder, uh, Brazil's judiciary, uh, we've been talking about this story ever since 2014, when, when Operation Car Wash uh, first began. Uh, it was hailed at the time. Remember, this is the growing pains of uh, of democracy. Yes, there's a lot of corruption that's being uncovered, but uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, your thoughts about what these uh, revelations by the Intercept show? I think it's a hit in the stomach for a lot of people who hailed Sergio Moro as a hero. Uh, they really believed in him, you know, to to clean up uh, corruption. And now, uh, it must be really difficult for these people to to find hope again in certain things and uh, how, how can you move forward when the only thing actually hoped uh, in is, is gone? Because in fairness, Sergio Moro pursued um, politicians from across the political exactly. spectrum. Exactly. So I think we also need to look at that. You know, there are a lot of politicians who have gone to prison who um, are from different political parties. So um, actually, I think it'd be interesting to see if these revelations also show um, uh, messages being exchanged about other politicians as well, because as you as you said, it's several different political parties. Um, so in order for us to actually um, see if there's a, a tendency of bias, it'd be interesting to see if there's communication also in, in regards to other cases. Andrew Fishman, is the problem in the conviction of Lula when, from the documents you have with the prosecutor colluding with that investigative magistrate who's now the justice minister? Or is the problem with the court that, well, just believed at face value what it was told? I think the problem is both. I think the problem is that, you know, independent of whether Lula did what they said they did, uh, it doesn't seem that they were able to, to prove that case. And he wasn't given a fair trial. That's the essence of this, is that, if what we reported is true, and I believe that it is because I've seen the conversation and we, and we vetted it very carefully, 
it means that the judge overstepped his bounds, his role as a judge, which is to be neutral and impartial, and he collaborated explicitly with the prosecution, which is uh, a violation of the basic tenets of, of the, any civilized justice system. So we have a case where, uh, you know, and, and this is important because Sergio Moro, as you pointed out earlier in this, in this segment, um, he's been responsible for convicting dozens of people and dozens of very high profile people. And, you know, uh, in Brazil, I think the one of the, one of, if not the most uh, uh, most important issues that most citizens feel is the the problem of corruption in society. So you know everybody, left, right, doesn't matter what your political leaning is, is uh, sympathetic to the push to try to root out corruption. However, you can't root out corruption by breaking the rules and and um, unethical behavior. And as many uh, legal analysts have said, that this is actually illegal behavior. So. Uh, it's, it's very important, and I, I don't think that necessarily the framing that the court was duped makes sense because it seems that the court was colluding with, or not colluding, but uh, collaborating with, um, uh, with the prosecution inappropriately. And speaking about the, the appeals uh, panel, the, 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 regional, the fourth regional uh, court, the, the three-judge panel, uh, one of the judges is an old a uh, friend from college of Sergio Moro, a, a long, a long time friend of his who's, who's written very flowering, flowery things about him. And the president of that court actually said that uh, the case is very strong and Moro did a, a, a wonderful job in his ruling, only to later in the same interview admit that he actually hadn't seen the underlying evidence in the case. So, I mean, just because uh, other courts have endorsed the rulings, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's you know uh, concrete, uh, uncontrovertible proof that Lula uh, is guilty exactly what they said he is. But it also doesn't mean that he's not. Um, and but that's that's what's at stake here. Does does the ex president and all the other people that are that have been implicated in this in this uh, these scandals do they deserve a fair trial or does it not matter because? We, the certain judges and certain people feel that they know that they're guilty. All right. Uh, we're going to pick up on that point when we come back. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate. We're reacting to uh, those leaked uh, revelations uh, that appear to show collusion between uh, what was then pro crusading magistrate Sergio Moro, now the justice minister in Brazil, and prosecutors in the conviction of Lula, Lula unable to run for president last year. Uh, with us to talk about it, Andrew Fishman, managing editor of The Intercept, which has published uh, those uh, leaks and, and, and uh, written them up in uh, re investigative reports uh, from Lisbon, Brazilian attorney uh, Fernando Santiago. Uh, we're also in the company of France 24, Tatiana, a writer, and Paris traffic could not keep him away. Glauber uh, Cesarino, a lecturer at the University of Paris 13. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Fishman, uh, uh, y your um, news outlet has made it clear there are many more leaks to come. Yes, uh, we've received a large amount of information. Um, I can't speak specifically on future reports or, or uh, when they're going to come out, but you know we're we're working extremely hard. And as soon as I leave here, I'll be going back to the office to to work on getting out uh, more information, more reports uh, as soon as we possibly can, while still maintaining journalistic rigor, making sure that everything's fact checked, everything is verified, and uh, you know we have not even been able to read anything, it would have been humanly impossible, that we've received. Um, but we've, we've spent weeks uh, working on these, on these reports so far, and there's certainly much, much more to come. Sergio Moro complained that um, you should have given him a right of reply before you published those initial findings Sunday. Uh, we published an editorial statement along with the first three reports, and I encourage everybody to go read it to explain the, the exact rationale between, behind uh, why we publish and why we feel that everything is in the public interest. Um, unfortunately, in Brazil, there's been 
Uh, a, in recent history, there's been a, many instances of the press being either censored or forced to remove articles from the air, or even um, preemptive censorship. And there's also been you know, raids against journalists. And so therefore, we felt that given uh, the power of those involved and the sensitivity of the case and, and also the, the overwhelming evidence that we had the, that was uh, you know, very clear, there's very little margin for, for uh, interpretation in, in many, much of what we reported, we decided that it was in the interest, it was in the public interest to make sure that the stories got out. And as soon as we published, the, the first thing that we did was we went out to them for comment, both the, the Lava Jato Task Force and also Sergio Moro. Um, and you know, they did not deny the legitimacy of, of the information. They, they tried to focus on the fact that they claim that this came from uh, you know, criminal means and therefore it's illegitimate and can't be used. Uh, however, the justice minister, uh, one of the ministers of the Supreme Court, uh, Gilmar Menges, said today that, in fact, even if it were to uh, come from illegal, uh, be procured illegally uh, by the source, not us, you know, we have the right to publish it as, as journalists, um, but if, if the source were to have acquired the information illegally, it still can be used in the defense uh, of Lula and all the others that were convicted, and, and it's to be seen, uh, legal scholars have to decide how much it can be used beyond that. And the, the public ministry has already opened an, uh, an inquiry into uh, the, the conduct of the prosecutors, and the Brazilian Bar Association has uh, insisted that both Sergio Moro and all, uh, all Lava Jato prosecutors that are involved be temporarily removed from their positions uh, pending an investigation. So I think that that speaks to the, the seriousness of, of, this, of these stories. Fernando Santiago, uh, do these reports uh, change your perception of Operation Car Wash, the anti-corruption probe that's been going since 2014, uh, more than 400 prosecutions, billions that have been uh, given back, uh, ad full admissions uh, by the likes of construction giant Odebrecht, your thoughts on Operation Car Wash in light of what you've been reading the last 48 hours? Well, of course, I think it shake up everybody's, what everybody thinks about the car wash operation. But uh, we shall not throw it away anyhow. I mean, it has many merits. Of course, uh, they are made by people, they're uh, run by people. And if there are mistakes, and uh, surely they might be, uh, they have a lot of uh, good things were done as well. And uh, they made a terrific uh, job in searching for evidence. Uh, again, as I said, we shall not uh, confuse material law with uh, procedural law. So we're talking about procedural law here and the, the evidence is there really strong. Not a, I'm not even talking about Lula. I'm talking about a lot of many other politicians that were uh, taken into this turmoil, which was the Lava Jato operation in Brazil, which is great results. And uh, of course, it has shown uh, that can have uh, uh, fails in some parts of it. Tatiana Ryder, just to remind our viewers, um, if the High Court decides to dismiss the charges at hand against uh, Brazil's former president, Lula still faces other charges. Yeah, and there are eight other charges. I believe that three of them are related to Sergio Moro, but the others aren't. So if he does uh, leave jail, there are still uh, all those other cases. And I'd just like to remind that uh, had him not be arrested now and he uh, able to participate uh, in, the, in the election, and had eventually won, he would not have been able to be prosecuted for any of these eight cases for another five years. So I think that is also uh, one of the reasons why they really um, made this case uh, go really quickly, much faster than normally would, because if it hadn't happened, then there would be a five-year you know, wait for the other cases. Glauber Zerazuno, if we turn back the clock to 2014, what do you think? Operation Car Wash, has it been good? for Brazil's democracy? Absolutely not. We, we always denounced the Operation Car Wash because it was a, clearly a political uh, operation. But there so, clearly was corruption and there clearly were billions that yeah, were but the, spread around. The objective is not to clean the corruption in Brazil. The, the, the objective of this operation was to criminalize one kind of political actors in Brazil that was clear. And one thing that we could not forget that 
content in form in judicial matters are, are very, very correlated. So it's, if the form of the process is completely corrupted, like uh, Intercept show us with this uh, Vaza, Vaza Jato gate, with this Lava Jato gate, called, like we said in Brazil, the content, the, the matter mem even of the, the process is completely contaminated. So but the magistrates have gone after politicians from across the political spectrum. Yes, but they, they uh, how do you say, uh, they, they acted a little bit uh, faster with some than with others. They uh, um, extrapolate the information with the press with some, not with the others. They, uh, they touch the political arena with the elections, like we saw uh, this time and not with the others so it's clearly a political a political matter uh, who, who are played by the, the judiciary system judiciary system Fernando Santiago no actually uh, I understand when he says that there were, most of the actions were taken uh, against the Labour's party but for me it's not because it is a political operation but because of the Labour's party has been in power for the last 20 years so it's normal that any kind of a, a corruption scandal goes against those who are uh, in job and post right now. That's why I don't think that we can say that Lava Jato is a, a political operation. Is, besides, it took uh, Temer as well. It took a lot of uh, uh, politicians from the uh, right or the center. I mean, many of them were concerned on these uh, scandals. But of course, if the Labour Party was in power, they were uh, the one it's because they were they were the they, they were they the party in power. Us. Andrew Fishman, do you agree with what you just heard from Glauber Cesarino that uh, Operation Car Wash, if you all told, has been bad for Brazil's democracy? I mean, I believe that the the principle of trying to make Brazilian society less corrupt and operate more according to the law uh, would, is, a, is a great principle. And I think that's why Operation Lava Jato was able to garner so much support uh, from the very beginning, because all Brazilians and anyone who pays attention to Brazil uh, knows that this is a huge problem. And this would, it would be amazing if you could snap your fingers and, and make it go away. Uh, and that's basically what the Lava Jato team promised to do. They said that we are the heroes here. We're going to come in. We're going to be superheroes, and we're going to save the country and and end corruption. However, obviously, uh, you know, and that was while Dilma Rousseff was still president. This this anti-corruption narrative was huge in the push to impeach her. And then when she was impeached, who came into power? Who impeached her? Eduardo Cunha, who was one of the most corrupt people in in Brazilian politics, who's currently in jail thanks to Lava Jato. And then who took her place? Michelle Tamer, who is extremely corrupt as well. And he's, being, uh, he's been accused of, of many, many crimes. And he's currently uh, actually sitting in, in jail waiting, waiting trial. And, uh, but who stayed in power? Uh, you know, the PT is, it did not, it's not like in the US where you have the Republicans and the Democrats. The Workers' Party had a massive coalition of many, many parties. And all of those parties called the Centro, or the, the center parties that kind of are always uh, scheming to find their way to stay with, with the ruling party, whoever it is, whichever side it is, they were able to stay in, in power. They were not uh, touched, even though there was very serious accusations against them. So, I mean, and, and, and this is also what happened with Bolsonaro, is that many people uh, have, the, the mood in Brazil is very low. Uh, there's been an economic recession for years, and people just wish, they know that Brazil has so much potential, which is true, and they just wish that things would work. And so many people wanted to believe that Bolsonaro would be the person that would come in and, and fix everything and, you know, bring along with him Sergio Moro, who's the guy who said that he was going to come in and fix him, fix everything. And then as very, very quickly, uh, Bolsonaro's approval ratings have dropped dramatically because they realized that actually he's not a superhero. He's not going to be able to fix things. He has many of his own corruption scandals, many of his own uh, deficiencies, and things are much more complicated than, than, you know, one person or one individual group can do. And so I think that it was a very exaggerated uh, bill of goods that was sold uh, about Lava Jato. And, uh, you know, if they really wanted to um, go after the roots of corruption in society, they would have had to go much deeper and, and operated in, a, in accordance with the law. Because otherwise, you yourself are, are uh, risking becoming the thing that you're fighting against.
Yeah, the, the, the question of rule of law, so important. Uh, a recent count found police in Rio kill five people a day. Human rights advocates sounding the alarm about uh, extrajudicial killings and the rise of paramilitary militias in the uh, uh, working class neighborhoods, in the favelas. But when he campaigned for president last year, Jair Bolsonaro said, those cops deserve medals. We have to guarantee self-defense for the good citizens. If one of us, civilian or soldier, is assaulted, if he shoots the attacker 20 times, it serves them right. He must be decorated and not judged. Tatiana Ryder, your thoughts on this kind of rhetoric and where it's taking Brazil's democracy right now? Uh, I think it's very dangerous, but at the same time, it's a lot, uh, what a lot of people... Because uh, people are fed up with crime. They are fed up if, with crime, and that's why they voted for him, a lot of them, because uh, they're scared on a daily basis of uh, not making home when they leave. Um, it's, it's a very dangerous uh, thing to say, also because now with the push to legalize uh, arms, um, that's also probably going to increase uh, crime. Uh, so it's, it's a t I think it's, it's not the good way to, to go uh, forward. But I just wanted to mention something, if I could, about Lava Jato and whether it's good for democracy. I think it has been really good for society because uh, it has gotten people out in the streets. And it has gotten people questioning things and questioning even their daily lives with petty corruption and, uh, you know, paying but, more attention to what's happening. But Brazil seems more polarized than it was in 2014. It is more polarized, but perhaps it's more polarized because we have more access to, to these informations and what's going on. Um, At uh, the same time, we, we saw with uh, Lava Jato and all the... The, the scandals that now we see with evidence, but we denounced this kind of, of uh, actions between uh, 2016 until now, is the trivialization of illegality because the, the judge and the prosecutor do not follow the law. So uh, what kind of democracy is that when judge and prosecutors are the, are the, have the same role, role? You know, they are both accusators in the process and they don't follow the law. Well, it's not by chance that the, the law, the bill, the project of bill, that Moro, is the same kind of thing. So we're going to open the, the spectrum of another and more and more extrajudicial uh, killings in Brazil because they, they try to, to, to relegate and uh, do not, uh, do not uh, in inquire about uh, killing by the police. That's the law that, Bolso, uh, that Moro wants to try to pass in the parliament. So this is not good for democracy. It's good for polarization. It's good for some kind of thought, political thought that uh, thinks that the, the, the ends justify the means. So it's not a problem if we are not uh, uh, following the law. If in the end, uh, in five years, 10 years, 15 years, we are no more, uh, no longer have corruption and all that. But we saw that it's, 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 not, the, <laughs> it's not the thing. Last week at the Vatican, the Pope addressed the Pan American Judges Summit on Social Rights. And there, uh, Pope Francis uh, stated uh, the following. He talked about something he called lawfare. He says it's used to undermine emerging political processes in the Americas and tends towards the systemic, systematic violation of social rights. Now, in those remarks, he's probably referring more to, although he didn't name any specific country, uh, Fernando Santiago, he's probably referring more to Central America. But that concept of lawfare, of using the law for political means, could it also apply to Brazil? Well, technically, it could be applied uh, everywhere. We are not uh, uh, away from this kind of risk, of course, and that's why we uh, lawyers and the people we are chair, uh, enrolled on the legal profession should avail so it cannot happen. Um, what we are, one of these cases that we should take into consideration right now is that the proof that was hacked, it is, uh, well, people will challenge the legality of such proof and that use illegal proofs for uh, any legal reasons is also one of the aspects of the lawfare. So um, I just can't imagine, I was just imagining right now, what if was Lula's defense uh, messages that were leaked? 
How would people react to it? Well, with the lawyers like uh, hiding some evidence, reforcing some other ones, and showing their inner game. Because uh, uh, what I mean, what I don't like, of course, if it's proved, is um, the part in which Sergio Moro discusses about the case with the prosecutor. On that case, there's nothing to say. He must be uh, totally neutral uh, concerning the prosecution. In what concerns the conversations between the prosecutors themselves, I mean, they are lawyers talking about their strategy, their points, which are strong, which are not strong. And I think from that point of view, I mean, uh, it's totally normal. I don't blame them for saying in this case, uh, this uh, argument is better than the other one. That's part of the game. Right, we're running short on time, so I want to ask you, Andrew Fishman, at this point. You heard Tatiana Ryder describe uh, how Brazil is more polarized uh, but uh, than it was when uh, the Operation Car Wash began. Uh, I know that um, uh, one of the founders uh, of your website, Glenn Greenwald, uh, who uh, viewers may remember as uh, the one who helped Edward Snowden, uh, with the, the uh, breaking the story, you want a Pulitzer Prize for it about uh, the NSA. Uh, there's been this hashtag uh, trending uh, this Tuesday in Brazil, uh, deport Greenwald. Your, your thoughts on the mood right now in the country after these revelations? I think that, uh, well, I know for a fact that everybody's talking about this. Um, and I think that the majority of the people uh, recognize the gravity of the situation. There are, there's obviously going to be a certain uh, percentage of the population that's always going to be uh, true blue motor supporters and Bolsonaro supporters, and they're going to try to, you know, divert the conversation and talk about other things rather than addressing the, the severity and the, and the content of what we reported. Um, obviously, it's really uh, deplorable that. Uh, there's a movement to try to expel a journalist from the country just for, for doing their job. Uh, obviously, it's deplorable any sorts of attacks on, on the freedom of the press, uh, which have been increasing and incur in Brazil and, and encouraged by Bolsonaro. Um, and I'd just like to make one other point about the uh, talking about the lawfare and the and the and the rule of law, uh, it's it's actually very very ironic that Bolsonaro that uh, Moro is is criticizing uh, the information we published as as allegedly being uh, illegal, because uh, very very famously Moro uh, was uh, wiretapping President Dilma in a conversation with with Lula uh, back when she was still president. And, and in 2016, at a very key moment when, when she was uh, considering nominating Lula to be a minister, which they allege was to defend, give him additional legal protections, uh, Moro leaked that conversation or, or allowed it to be made public to the press. Uh, and it was, it was very uh, essential in, in, in changing the, the public discourse uh, against them at that moment. However, at the time, the warrant that he had issued had already expired. So actually what he was doing was he was allowing an illegal wiretap <laughs> against the president of the country to happen. And then knowing that it was illegal, he decided to leak it publicly. And throughout the entirety of the Lava Jato process, the, the Operation Car Wash operation, uh, they have, the prosecutors and Moro have been expertly leaking information to the press, uh, and the press have been, you know, very much partners, the local press have been very much partners in, in uh, you know, pushing their, their narrative and pushing their message, and they never seem to have a problem with, with leaks or with, uh, you know, uh, intimate conversations being revealed when it served their own political interests. But when, obviously, when they're in the crosshairs, then all of a sudden uh, they have a very different tone, and it's just, I think it's very ironic. Andrew Fishman, I want to thank you so much for joining us from Rio. I want to thank as well Fernando Santiago for being with us today uh, from Lisbon, Glauber Cesarino, and France 24's Tatiana Reiter. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. All right, we mentioned that... Uh, Hashtag, we say hello to James Queen. Hello, Hi, James. Let's yes. be polite. That's right. We We're in France. That, Bonjour. <laughs> we, we mentioned that hashtag, deport Greenwald. Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, 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 one of a few that was doing the rounds uh, today on social media. So, of course, uh, the articles themselves are also circulating a lot online uh, from The Intercept <coughs> with uh, that ethical question about uh, uh, and, and on all of the consequences as well. As, as we've seen, this, this on our own website, Brazil's top court review, Lula, case as he leaks 
as the leaks cast doubt on judges' integrity. So really, it's a story that's gone uh, viral around uh, around the world. But uh, Moro Criminoso is one of the, the hashtags that has uh, that's the other side. taken right. off. That's right. right. Okay. So uh, Moro is a criminal, I suppose. And you can see the kind of images or memes that are kind of accompanying that, sometimes anti-crime as Justice mm -hmm. Minister, but always uh, anti etico a kind of a strange Portuguese-English uh, mix there. Uh, and also uh, images such as this one. Uh, how would you translate that? Scoundrel of the year, something like yeah, that? Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, not, it's not a compliment. Right. So uh, essentially his image and uh, all sorts of um, critical language have been uh, doing the rounds under that hashtag Moro Criminoso, which essentially uh, uh, what we're seeing, of course, uh, in in increasingly in many countries at the moment is very polarised uh, conversations or commentary on social media. And certainly that's the case here. Massive uh, polarisation. Uh, nothing new under the sun. Uh, Brazil in 2019 and I suppose the meltdown of uh, maybe new and political that, that, that viewer wanting to uh, wanting to hit both uh, both crowds there. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> clearly just wanting to share that cartoon because the other big hashtag of of the day is deport Greenwald uh, and you can see I could I saw that kind of comments such, such as that even for example this is uh, the committee of for, for investigative journalism they were sharing this lots of journalism outfits were kind of interested in the leak aspect and comments on that straight away journalists without credibility should be deported urgently and in fact that has that, that was a whole theme. In fact, Glenn Greenwald himself drew attention to the fact that these were the two sort of um, uh, most, uh, two of the most uh, uh, viral uh, hashtags today uh, on that issue. So some of the comments under that hashtag were predictable enough. This man is not welcome here in Brazil because he is against uh, Lava Jato Operation Car Wash, the largest anti-corruption operation in the country and one of the largest in the world. Now that's a pretty respectable comment under that hashtag because a lot of it was uh, really personal attacks on Glenn Greenwald, uh, some of it uh, homophobic, some of it uh, xenophobic. Uh, that's at least how one uh, blogger uh, described it uh, here. A hashtag, Deporto Greenwald, which it confirms that there are no, there is no bottom to this toilet, septic tank, uh, it, 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 in terms of commentary online in Brazil. So that's obviously somebody who feels uh, mm. very angry about uh, the, the level of comment under that hashtag, which was uh, quite personal. Now, there were, other, were others, uh, Francois, who were tweeting, uh, thank you, uh, Greenwald, uh, Valeu Greenwald. So, you know, the, it, it wasn't just a case of people asking for him to be deported. Now, one final uh, comment in that regard. Some criticism for uh, uh, one of the biggest dailies in the country, O Globo, for what some are calling two um, double standards um, for the way in which they reported three years ago on uh, leaked conversations between Lula and Dilma in, in, in these corruption investigations. And here, the front page uh, today was much more of a sort of, um, I think they were commenting more on the fact that the hacking took place than on the content of the hacking, if, if, I, if I understood that correctly. Mm. But in any case, some criticism for uh, all global's coverage of this is it there's also the, there's also the distinction perhaps to be made between the editorial board and the journalists themselves. Yeah, of course. But uh, O Globo, it's, uh, it's a journal who has aligned with, uh, with Moro since the beginning of the car wash operation. So it's kind of uh, uh, a judge uh, by preference of the, of the journal. So they don't, they don't want to start to, 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 uh, to fight against Moro in this, in this exact time. So it's much more condescendent uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, centering the, the illegal uh, in the illegal wiretaps than than otherwise. Then instead right. of what the the, co the mm. content is, when you can see on this front cover, they they were just word for word reporting yeah. on uh, the leaks three years ago between uh, uh, Dilman and Lula. So some saying a double standard there. We shall see. Many yes. thanks, James thanks Creed. This story is going to keep on running. I want to thank mm. our panel once again. Thank you for joining us here in the France Twenty Four. Very good accent, Jay.